Welcome to NSS Connections. As you know, this is a series of monthly virtual programs for sculptors. Uh, my name is Gwen Peer, and I'm here in New York City in the NSS offices. And our presentation today is photographing your artwork. Photographs are often the first introduction someone has to your work and your potential audience now includes millions of people viewing artwork on computer screens. Um, more recently, uh, or more importantly, a targeted audience of galleries, museums, and other arts organizations, such as the National Sculpture Society, are looking for a high level of expertise in those photos. Our first look at a work is usually not of the sculpture itself, but the photograph of the sculpture. We want to help ensure that your photos look professional and show your work at its best. And that is why we are delighted to have photographer Andy Lay with us today to provide some guidance and share some of his methods and tips. Andy has been attending NSS events for several years. Many of you have probably met him um, with his wife, Danella, who is also joining us this evening. Um, Danella is an NSS board member and is also the ambassador of the NSS Texas community. Most of the photographs you have seen in our publications and news media of our various events and sculpture conferences, awards dinners, um, most of those were taken by Andy in recent years. So we're very fortunate to have Janella on our board and Andy is an enormous bonus. <laughs> They're both great friends of NSS. So before we move to Andy in Texas, I just wanted to mention we're expecting about 120 people. So please remain muted um, and enter any questions you might have in the chat room. So without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Andy Lay. Thank you, Gwen. Hey, uh, let me share my screen, get us going. All righty. Gwen, tell me when you were set up and I'll get started. Okay, I'm just trying to spotlight you. Okay. Okay, there we go. I think we're good to go, thank you. Alrighty, thanks Gwen. I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. I have a passion for photography and I have a love for art. Uh, I love art so much that over 40 years ago, I fell in love with an artist and I married her. And uh, she is wonderful. She supports me in my photography and, and she helped tremendously with this presentation. So ready to get started. And so let me um, do a little, just so you know, um, as Gwen might have mentioned, we're, we are uh, recording this presentation and I, I sent her a, a, a PDF version of these slides. So we have a lot of material to cover and I'll try and move pretty quickly to keep it moving. and. Um, you can uh, capture something if you need to, but uh, got questions, enter them in the chat as we go along, and then uh, Gwen will feed those back to us um, during our, uh, a few breaks that we have. So, um, and if you need to get a hold of me, I have further questions, or uh, I've got my contact information at the uh, at the end of the of the presentation. So. Uh, Gwen covered a, a little bit of my background there. And for those of you who don't meet, Donella and I uh, went to college together. Uh, we both graduated from Princeton University uh, a while back. And uh, I went on and got my master's degree from, in, from engineer, in engineering at SMU in Dallas while I was working uh, for the place that ultimately would become Lockheed Martin, where I spent 38 years as a, uh, as a software design and system design engineer and uh, as well as a, a variety of other things. So uh, right now, I uh, retired from that job. I spend most of my time using uh, cameras and technology because uh, uh, being with my engineering background, I love that part of it. And most of the things I photograph are uh, landscapes, uh, travel photography, uh, uh, and aircraft I, uh, is one of my loves. The, uh, so I uh, have joined a, professional organization and, uh, and achieved uh, uh, some significant degrees and uh, certifications that you can see there. And uh, I always want to be challenging myself to, to continue to get better and, uh, 
and uh, experience, uh, hopefully to uh, allow other people to experience situations and places around the world uh, that they may not be able to see otherwise. So let's get started. Uh, as Gwen mentioned, um, my wife is, uh, a, uh, has been interested as a patron and a, a board member of the NSS. And uh, starting about 2010, when uh, we started attending the weekend celebrations, um, I couldn't resist taking pictures of the event. That was just one of my uh, one of the things I enjoy doing. And and I and after the presentation, if you want to take a look at uh, my website, uh, andylay.com, and in the galleries, there's an NSS section that has uh, nine of the ten years of uh, the last celebrations that you can uh, look over. And so, I really consider it a privilege and an honor to support the sculpting community. Uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know the, uh, the, the sculptors uh, at the events and the staff. And time to time they need pictures, I supply them for uh, uh, pro bono. And, um, and, and it's really been a win-win situation uh, for, for both of us. And I do want to offer up a couple of thanks here before we get uh, into the material. And that is, uh, you know, for the NSS and Gwen for providing this platform here. Um, I am I'm ex excited to be able to share uh, some of this because uh, of my uh, passion, just as I'm sure you like to share your, your passions. And I want to put out a special thanks to Darren Wright of Fort Worth. He's a, a sculptor that uh, we're, we've gotten to know pretty well here uh, in recent years. And I'll be using one of his sculptures that we recently acquired from him. It's uh, as my illustrations uh, and demonstrations. And so the, uh, you can see the title there and he has a, a, you know, his own website, including some pictures of uh, some of the art that we're gonna be looking at today. So let's get started. Um, so uh, Gwen mentioned uh, the importance of uh, uh, photographing sculpture and how critical it is to, um, uh, artists of, of, of every nature there. And uh, so I'm not saying anything you don't know, but the, the digital media world is uh, growing and will continue to grow and dominate our lives for and, and, and the next several generations. Uh, the, the crazy thing is that people assume that they can look at uh, your sculpture, pictures of your sculptures and be able to really evaluate its essential qualities and uh, that's, you know, it's not always true, but it, it's a reality. And uh, you can see there's a, a variety of different organizations and people that, that of necessity, because it, you can't uh, deliver your sculptures and show them in person. Uh, and uh, uh, so photographing your artwork is, 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 an, is an essential necessity. The, uh, I, I didn't mention social media and, uh, uh, your website that you would need obviously uh, photographs for. But the bottom line is for, for sculpture, sculptors is at some point in your business, you will need photographs of your artwork. So this is a, it's an essential part of uh, being an, uh, an artist and a sculptor, sculptor. The challenge is, is trying to represent a 3D in, image uh, in, a, in a 2D medium, uh, either on the screen or printed. Um, you know, the uh, sculptors constantly are, are working in a 3D world, but the digital world is uh, only 2D. There are some stereo, uh, stereo lithography and, and um, stereo uh, 3D displays and uh, goggles that people can use. But for the most part, um, we're, we're really challenged with a 2D world for our photography. So. Uh, and, and the bottom line is you can't fully represent a, a 3D artwork in a 2D world. So uh, the good news is, is uh, painters and photographers have been re recognizing that for uh, you know, over a century now. And they've worked out some things that, uh, uh, some ways to uh, enhance that. And we'll be covering some of, some of those. So um, I'll, let me pause also for just a second to let you, let you know that I know for a fact that there are a number of NSS members that are excellent photographers. 
And to them, some of this material might seem basic. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a lot of common sense things here, but I found that common sense is not always common practice. And so uh, this is also just an encouragement as well. So I kind of have uh, a goal there and three sub goals and uh, three key points I want to cover and three demos. So we've got three sets of three there. So, um, but I really want to, um, to give you a, a couple of different ways, uh, some ideas about different ways to capture uh, good images of your work. Um, and uh, work that uh, photographs that do actually bring attention to the desired features and quality of your artwork. And I'm very conscious of uh, the time and money aspect of it. Uh, that's, uh, it's a, it's a, a significant factor for anyone who's in business, anyone who's creating. Um, uh, there's, you'll see uh, one of the demonstrations there it's, it, uh, from a professional point of view, and if you're not a professional photographer, you certainly uh, would be a serious investment to try and go that route. Uh, so I am, uh, I am aware of that as a as a constraint that you deal with. So I've got three key points we're going to work on first, which is uh, background, lighting, and perspective. And in each case, I'll be using my photographs that I took uh, the last couple of days of uh, Darren's work uh, to illustrate these, and uh, so you can see real pictures of um, uh, hopefully to understand where, where I'm going with these. So first point is uh, uh, getting a good background. And it's, it's uh, again, this is a simple concept, uh, but as Gwen pointed out, uh, I've heard of multiple instances where potentially exceptional sculpt sculpture was not given serious consideration because of poor backgrounds. Uh, and I'll illustrate that in the, in, in the next slide. But you can see the features there, we want a good background, it, it's, and it's, it's quite simple, keep it simple. Um, uh, sometimes color can help with a, a, a sculpture with a background, but for the most part, you really want a black or a white or gray or some soft muted color. And it should be a, a, an easy setup. Again, I understand if you're creating art and you're trying to get it out the door or trying to share it and get it on into a competition, uh, you don't want to have to set up a big uh, studio and then break it down again. So it's easy setup and low cost. Uh, and it's, it's very important because the presentation of your artwork in that fleeting moment when somebody opens it and, and glances at your image is, I mean, that's, that's the whole window into your world. And so we want to minimize the distractions and keep the, uh, the emphasis on your artwork. So, so, uh, the, uh, so here's an illustration. It's just a simple one. Uh, I took the, uh, the picture on the right in my, my photography storeroom and put it on a table and snapped the picture. And as you can see, you, you can hardly tell the sculpture apart from the background. And, uh, you know, uh, Gwen mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of times people would just set it on their furniture and take pictures and that furniture may have, uh, you know, a variety of different patterns on it. So we really want to get um, um, an easy way to get a good background. And then let me show you a, a little demonstration of that. Also, I, I picked up some pictures off of the web uh, you'll see uh, some of these are just uh, pictures of artwork in, in, uh, in public. And uh, you can see the, the three on the left there. It's kind of, um, again, distracting to see, uh, to try and see those, um, those creations in amidst that background. The one on the right is not too bad if it's in public and it's outdoors. Uh, there are photographic techniques where the, the background will blur and, and, and kind of uh, um, put it into uh, uh, a little bit of a, a background perspective there and highlight the sculpture in the front. So uh, there are ways of, of doing that, but it's, um, for the most part, a good clean background is the best way to go. So um, second key point is good lighting. 
And um, this is uh, important because uh, uh, directional light is necessary to, to create the highlights and shadows to help define the 3D forms in your artwork. Um, if you use, for example, a lot of people would use a flash that's built into their cell phone or on uh, a camera, a pop-up flash or a flash that attached. And that gives a flat view of the, uh, uh, of the object. Uh, it's lit from the straight, uh, straight on. A, a directional light in, uh, in our photography, uh, artwork or people, we always want to uh, get the, the light source uh, 45 to 90 degrees off of the, uh, uh, of the camera line of sight so that we get some uh, sense of the, the dimensionality of the, of the object. So um, color quality is important uh, to be able to accurately reflect the patina. Um, and again, I want to make that easy to set up and, and, and low cost. So it's, um, uh, the hard part is getting good light that also allows you to see highlights and shadows. Um, I'll give you an illustration of, on the next page of harsh lighting uh, that's uh, somewhat, uh, uh, so you can see what, what I'm talking about here. And that is uh, the one on the left is a single flash that I just uh, hit the sculpture with uh, as opposed to a, a a combination of, of flashes that have or strobes that uh, with diffuse lighting and I'll show you how we get to each of those. Um, the main difference again as I mentioned before is the level of detail in the high and the lightest and darkest areas. Uh, this is not unlike a photographer trying to take a picture in the midday sun where it's real bright on parts and real dark in the shadows. And uh, I have to uh, talk about some of the techniques that I used uh, to uh, counteract that in the third demo that I'll be showing you there. But you can see on the on the left there, uh, the, the the collar area of the uh, figure in the back uh, has a lot of detail in it and a lot of work that went into it, and, and you just can't see it there. Same thing on that on that uh, breastplate of King Arthur, uh, too bright it washes out those details and you can't see it. So good lighting is, is important there. So third key point is uh, um, a good perspective. And, and what we're talking about there is it's is trying to get an image and take uh, the, the, the proper um, distance from the subject and the proper lens uh, so that it mimics as best we can what our eyes see. Um, that's uh, real important because the, if you're, uh, uh, as I'll illustrate on the next chart or two, if you get too close, if you use a wide angle lens, uh, it starts to distort features and it doesn't show them in, in uh, their actual uh, relationship to one another. And so we wanna see those uh, as best we can uh, in a way that re accurately, accurately reflects the actual proportions of your, of your sculpture. So it's, um, uh, you can see that's important, you know, for um, a variety of reasons there. But um, if, if people don't have a, a, if your image is not built with a good perspective there, then it makes it very difficult for people to get a, a good idea of how well you have proportioned your sculpture. And I know that's a you know, that's, that's a critical dimension or critical aspect of, of, uh, of a good sculpture. And so you certainly want to reflect that in, the, uh, in any image that you might create from that. So uh, here is, uh, again, that same sculpture. I, I use my cell phone because it was just really um, easy to, uh, to illustrate that. And the, um, on the left, I, I used my camera my cell phone has three built-in lenses. One's a wide angle, which you show on the left, and then it has a telephoto, which is on the right. And, uh, and, and what causes perspective issues in, in photography is the choice of lens or what we call the focal length of the lens. The longer focal length lenses allow you to be further away from the subject. Uh, wide angle lens requires that you 
be quite close to the subject and that's typically what causes the unwanted distortions that we see. So um, you can try this on your cell phone too if it has multiple lenses like mine, but uh, let me point out some of, the, some of the problems here. And that is that we have uh, on the one, on the left, you'll see that the, all of the, uh, the image elements that are near the edge or closest to the camera get distorted. Uh, the helmet and hand of King Arthur looks gigantic relative to his head, for example. Um, his foot is stretched out to the left. The, uh, the figure on the right, uh, upper right, uh, gets uh, severely distorted using that wide angle lens. So perspective, being able to step back, take, uh, taking a, a longer view is generally always going to be better. Um, uh, I might mention too that it's um, uh, some cameras, uh, both digital cameras and cell phone cameras have uh, an optical zoom as well as a digital zoom. And um, uh, the optical zoom is always going to be preferable. And um, uh, the, the, the digital zoom, uh, it should be avoided for this purpose because uh, it, it can introduce its own set of undesirable artifacts into the image. So uh, I hit those three points pretty quick. Uh, uh, Gwen, do we have any, any questions in the chat that we need to? Um... Not yet. Okay, so um, during the presentation, if something doesn't make sense or have some ideas uh, that you want to throw, please feel free to enter those in the chat and then uh, we'll cover those. Uh, we'll have some time at the end to hit those as well. Alrighty, so I got three demonstrations I want to uh, share with you. Um, I kind of went to the extremes in these demonstrations, uh, but I wanted to show you there's a really a vast range of options that uh, the decent photography allows us to, to use. Uh, the first one is almost too simple. It's a very low cost, uh, no cost solution. And, uh, and, the, and the last one's probably excessive cost, uh, but that's uh, you know, unless you're willing to go buy a bunch of professional gear. You have to decide what the right balance is uh, for your situation, depending on your client, depending on the, the use of that, that imagery. Uh, but I wanted to give you an idea. There's a whole range of ways to get decent pictures. Uh, I also acknowledge that this dem these demonstrations are all using a, a relatively small sculpture. Um, but the principles are, are still applicable to larger pieces. It just would take a lot. Uh, uh, larger materials or larger space uh, in order to, to generate similar results. So first one. Um, so this is a real simple, like I said, uh, almost trivial case, which is using my cell phone camera. Uh, no additional light sources of, uh, other than what's already available. Um, I use existing materials I found around the house and I didn't do any post-processing to this. Uh, normally all of my pictures I do as a professional, I'll uh, be editing those in Photoshop or Lightroom or, or some other uh, software. This one, these are all straight out of the camera. So, um, so I use my cell phone in my storeroom and, some, and, and, a, and as an indoor picture and then some, a couple of outdoor uh, examples uh, to try and see if I could come up with a decent image. So. We'll see what you think. So I just started out, I said, oh, there's that same picture, no background, doesn't look very good. Um, so I looked around, I had a, an old piece of foam board there. Um, uh, the only cost there is if you went out and bought it, Hobby Lobby, it cost you about six bucks. And the only light that I had in that room was my ceiling fan. But if I eliminate the clutter, and um, expose that properly, um, I get a, you know, a lot better than having all that clutter in the background. Uh, and th this is okay, but I wanted to further isolate the, the sculpture from the table, because uh, there could be some carpenters out there saying, oh, I wonder how they made that table. I don't want that thought to even cross their mind. So 
Uh, I looked in our closet, found an old um, uh, bed sheet and just covered the table. I could have ironed the sheet, uh, but that was too much work for me. So <laughs> I, uh, so I just um, spread that out and smoothed it. And I got a couple of decent pictures. Um, as you can see, uh, two simple additions, you know, the background and the sheet, no editing. Um, uh, you know, not bad or not, not, not the best quality in terms of uh, some shadow detail missing and a few highlights there. So uh, I tried uh, heading outside and we got sunlight. So I tried to get better outdoors uh, pictures. Uh, looked around my porch, found my, uh, one of my, our tables back there. And uh, important thing is it's, an, it's obviously, I, uh, hopefully it's obvious, but that has to be in the shade. If we direct sunlight is going to get is not going to give you the diffuse light that we talked about earlier. Um, uh, it definitely needs to be in the shade, and and it turns out as a as a rule of thumb, the closest you can get to the edge of the shade um, is the is better because you'll get a lot more of the. Uh, um, uh, reflected light helping you in the shadow areas. But went out there and uh, used the same foam board, the same sheet, and uh, and took that picture. And you can see that's uh, yeah, it didn't come out too bad for a cell phone photo. And that's again because we have decent light. Uh, these cameras today um, are highly dependent on uh, having good light. The better the light, the better the picture is going to come out. And so this is a, a nice uh, open shade picture of what, what we would call that. So I saw a little more shade in front of my, uh, the door to my garage. I said, oh, I wonder how that would be. So I carried a table from in the house and put it out there. Same sheet and, uh, and backdrop there. A little bit of trouble because the um, uh, the table wasn't quite big enough, and, and uh, so you got a little bit of the door there on the on the left side. But I zoomed in a little bit and got this shot. Uh, here I've got a little bit uh, more highlights than I did in the previous one. And that's just because of I moved across the yard and we get more reflections. The interesting thing is, once you uh, start studying these photographs, you'll find that everything in the total environment reflects uh, some color cast or directionality of the light. And so in this case, it, uh, uh, it could have been uh, a wall, it could have been the sidewalk, it could have been the, the other part of the building that contributed to that. But as three examples of uh, virtually no expense was to, get some, to get some decent, uh, to get some decent pictures. So the next demonstration is what I call the moderate cost demonstration. And there where I'm using a, a point and shoot camera, um, uh, I've got a picture of it a little bit later here. Um, I found these nice uh, bright uh, LED bulbs online. Um, I bought them for another reason, they came in a pack of four, so I picked them up. Uh, four of them cost about $35, so, um, uh, they're not too expensive and they put out a, the equivalent of about 150 uh, watt light bulb and it's nice and bright and, uh, and it's, it's uh, temperature balanced at 5000 Kelvin, Kelvin, which is a nice clean white light uh, that we need. Use a clamp ref reflector that I had there. Um, the addition here is instead of having the, the foam board, which is just kind of a solid white paper, using a gradient paper, uh, which uh, I believe actually it was several um, uh, NSS celebrations a while back, somebody turned me on to this, one of the other photographers. And uh, there's a, a company called Flowtone that makes these. And this graduated from solid white to a, to a, uh, a light gray. And then I, uh, found a way to hang those up and uh, use them as a good background. So for the lighting and the background, I uh, estimated that would cost about $120. 
the camera was existing. You can use your point and shoot camera. You could use a cell phone as far as you want. These are just additions that you can uh, kind of layer on to your, uh, your experience there. I did uh, include the cost details for those materials and uh, a couple charts at the end of this, uh, at the end of the presentation. I won't be covering that today, but it will be available in the PDF that, uh, that's online. So there's the graduated paper there hanging in, uh, in uh, what was formerly our living room, which is now my studio, and uh, the uh, LED bulb and the, and the clamp. Uh, there's the point and shoot camera. Uh, this gives a step up from a uh, cell phone camera. Uh, the reason is it uh, kind of basically two things. One is the sensor that we're using to capture the image is larger, and so we get uh, more detail. And the second thing is the lens is larger and, and higher quality, and therefore we have a, a, a better image to start one from. You don't need a tripod to shoot these. Uh, um, you can hand hold them. And I started out hand holding them, but I was taking so many pictures trying to get it uh, right that it was easier just to leave it on the tripod that, uh, that I had there. So here's my initial, uh, initial try at that. And I had uh, that one LED light off to the left, up about uh, roughly 45 degrees. And uh, you can see that that uh, initial image was too dark on the right hand side. And so we lost uh, the title uh, of the image and we lost all the details on the right hand side. And we got a pretty harsh shadow there that really doesn't um, add to the picture, kind of distracts. Again, I grabbed my foam board that I uh, used in the first demo and just propped it up there um, as, a, as a makeshift reflector. So again, my lights on the left, uh, the foam boards on the right. And so you can see with that reflector, I, it did a, a great job of giving me a soft fill and brightening to, that brightened the right hand side and filled in some of those shadows that we see. So uh, we're moving in the right direction. So the, um, uh, those shadows are still a little bit too, um, uh, sharp for me and uh, still uh, the dark areas are still getting lost. You can't see under the, the rear figure's arm, for example. Um, and so the, uh, uh, I use a very sophisticated technique for um, diffusing the light that we talked about previously. Um, and that was a paper towel. Uh, so that's uh, and that was Donella's suggestion. I was trying some other things. She said, here, try this paper towel. So we taped that over the front of it and it, uh, it basically takes that harsh spotlight and makes a larger uh, source for the light uh, before it hits the sculpture. And uh, uh, that you can do a paper towel with an LED bulb. I would not recommend that with a filament bulb because they get pretty hot and we wouldn't want to start a fire with your, uh, with your light. But um, it worked great with that LED light. So the paper towel was a, as, a, as a diffuser, look at what happened on the right hand side. That, that shadow got very soft. All the highlights got softened. Now I don't have sharp highlights, I've got dull highlights and it, uh, it, it brought out a lot more detail in the, uh, in, the, in the shadow areas because I've got a broader light source that we're able to, uh, uh, to hit the image with. So here's the uh, final image on the left there and on the right a, a, little, uh, a little enlargement of that center area. You got a lot of detail and uh, most of the, the, the shadow areas are visible there. Probably for a single light with a single reflector and a paper towel, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's quite good and uh, quite acceptable for a lot of uh, uses for your, for your image. So last one is, uh, like I said, this in this example, I used my professional studio gear 
the, to produce a uh, more of a museum quality high res image. Uh, the cameras are 61 megapixel, which is uh, much more than you normally ever need. In, in photography, I used a, a uh, professional lens that's uh, known for, for providing a, a very uh, linear planar uh, image of the, uh, of the subject. But um, in this case, I used uh, three studio flashes what I call monolight strobes, and um, they're quite powerful. Um, to trigger those, we use a wireless trigger uh, called a, a pocket wizard. Uh, and I use three different modifiers uh, to those lights. So almost never do you use a flash directly uh, exposed to, a, um, to any subject. Uh, especially this artwork. So one of them was uh, uh, is a modifier that we call a soft box, which is basically a, uh, a big umbrella in a box shape that has a couple of diffusers built into it and um, with, a, with a flash behind it. So again, it gives very soft light, very diffuse light. Uh, another one is a, a simple umbrella reflector. Uh, turn the flash away from the subject and then reflect it back with this uh, with this umbrella. Again, it gives a, a, a broader picture. I mean, a broader source for the light and then uh, and better uh, better dif more diffuse light. And then third one is uh, you'll see in a minute here is uh, what I call a normally for. For a portraiture, we call a hair light, but it's a, a rim light, a highlight. It's back behind the subject a little bit to, again, give some additional separation from the background. In my case, I uh, also want the color to be accurate. And so I have a, a color reference um, device that I take a picture of, and it, it uh, helps me adjust the final image to make sure it is accurate uh, as, as I can be. Uh, for, uh, for color accuracy. I use a, a flash meter to get the light right. And then I use that same gradient background there. Post-processing, um, you all have all heard about Lightroom before. Um, there's uh, also, excuse me, you've heard about Photoshop. Some of you may also have heard about uh, Lightroom, which is a, a, another product that Adobe makes. And then uh, for editing, uh, and then there's another, product that I use uh, called Photomatics, which uh, I'll explain a little bit later for high dynamic range photography. So let's move into, uh, here's the deal, the bottom line, that's a lot of, well, that's a lot of equipment. So uh, just to sum that up, that's, you know, close to $6,000 worth. And uh, if you want to get into it, that's great. If you don't, that's uh, you probably don't want to, have to invest that much. Uh, here's the, the, the setup, the setup, the, uh, the three studio strobes that I have that I uh, have circled there on the left. You can see the uh, soft box on the far right, the uh, umbrella on the left, and then up at the top is the, uh, is the rim light. And on the right hand side, you can see that rim light's way up high and back behind the, uh, the sculpture. And you'll see how that how that works. Here's the camera, my Sony uh, camera. That's an A7R Mark IV, and the uh, and the lens that I'm using. So uh, there's the color uh, device, uh, color accuracy device that I use there. It's called a color checker, and uh, I take a picture of it using the lighting that um, uh, will be used for the sculpture. And in the uh, uh, post-processing, I'm able to use that as a color correction to make sure we get accurate color. You can see the light meter in the, in the front tells me uh, I'm shooting all of these with a fairly small aperture, which means that's a lot of depth of field. So we get a lot of detail in, in the whole sculpture from front to back. And then uh, I put the camera on the tripod and I use a wireless remote uh, to trigger the, the camera. Uh, we, it's a technique that we use in photography to, to keep from shaking the camera. We don't even want to touch it when, uh, when we're trying to take the picture because any vibration uh, will, will blur the picture slightly. 
So we use a wireless remote in order to, uh, to take those pictures. In my case, I actually took five different pictures to get one. And um, this is a technique to use because we have, um, due to the characteristics of uh, the sensors and cameras versus our human eye, um, what, our human eye can see a lot more range of darks to light than a camera can, and even more so than uh, what your computer screen can. And so I take five different exposures, one that's underexposed uh, to two degrees, and then one that's overexposed to two different stops, we call them, and uh, capture those together. So the that's called uh, HDR um, photography or high dynamic range. And uh, basically all five of those are combined in an app, a software program, I mentioned there, Photomatics, to produce the final image. And the reason for that is that the, the human eye can perceive about 20 different stops or doublings of light. Uh, so a dynamic range of our human eye can distinguish light to dark uh, on a scale of a million to one. Pro cameras can only do about 15 stops. Uh, your monitor can do about 10 stops of, um, of dynamic range. And a printed photo can only host about seven stops. So HDR is a way to, to, to capture images and process them so that um, it's uh, closer in that in, on a printed or computer monitor to what your eye perceives um, than, uh, than normal if you just take a, a single photograph. So after uh, I do the HDR processing and some uh, adjustments in Lightroom, uh, this is the final image. And you'll see, again, all the, the shadows are soft, the highlights are, are muted, and you, and you get a lot of detail. So I'll show you uh, a couple of close-ups of uh, from that same picture, I just blew those up uh, so that you could see the uh, the level of detail there. I mean, I'm really excited because we bought this sculpture and Darren put a lot of work into it. That helmet has the gash that uh, uh, where the sword hit his his helmet, and uh, you know every little detail is there. And so if if uh, you're trying to show a picture. That's um, uh, professional will give you that level of uh, quality and detail. So in summary, uh, we've had those three different uh, uh, demonstrations. Uh, the first one's good for social media, for uh, beginners, uh, use your cell phone. Uh, there's no reason why you can't get good pictures from that. If you own your own uh, camera, uh, you might want to spend a little bit more uh, from background, lighting, some, some things there, especially if you've got a, an interest in photography and uh, take it to the next level. Um, if you're serious about photography, there's, uh, uh, you know, it'll cost a lot, and, uh, but you can get some really good results. And on the other hand, if uh, you want the, the, that professional quality stuff, you know, hiring a photographer for two or three hundred dollars to get you uh, multiple high quality images of your sculpture uh, makes a lot of sense there as well. So let me show you, uh, we saw, we looked at each of those three in uh, separately. Uh, let's take a look at them side by side. So there's the low cost image, the cell phone one, um, taken outdoors and then the one indoors with, uh, with just a single light and reflector and paper towel. Uh, now, if we take that uh, moderate cost one, compare that to the, uh, the high cost one. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll say the color's a little more accurate. You get a little more, uh, uh, you see some of the, the reflections up there on the, on the top heads of the, of the figures there. We came from that uh, hair light, that rim light. Uh, get a, a really good uh, all-around image. But what's best for you is your choice. 
uh, you need to decide where you're going to put your money and your time in order to get those images. I will mention that, um, you know, just because you have an image captured, that's not the end. <laughs> that's just kind of the starting point because you got to, I, I recognize you still have to, you know, get that out of the camera into an editing program. Uh, there's lots of them out there that can use to tune up your image. When I say that, I mean crop them to get out again to focus uh, as much as you can on the on your sculpture. Uh, get the color balance correct and uh, clean up any uh, artifacts that are artificial that you want to uh, eliminate. And there are a lot of uh, free apps for your cell phone. Snapseed is a very powerful, uh, popular one. Adobe Photoshop Express Editor is available. Uh, both of those are for both Android and uh, 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 iPhones and Macs and PCs. Um, and then uh, I will mention that it's, it's uh, generating a, um, the final file for uploading and printing is sometimes a bit tricky. Uh, if you're not familiar with all the photography uh, techno babble, uh, it can be pretty confusing. Uh, you want 1024 pixels on the longest side, a 72 DPI, three megapixels or less saved. Well, what does that mean? Uh, or another one, and these are quotes from real submissions that I looked up on art calls online. And they wanted a full high resolution image in RGB color mode. Um, I know what that means, but uh, uh, most people are not familiar with what a color mode is. And if I sent a full high resolution image, it could be a, a single image, could be megabytes. I mean, they certainly, I mean, uh, very large. So they certainly don't want that. Um, you may end up having to call the folks that are asking for your photograph and uh, get their support for that type of thing. Or you can always uh, contact your your, your local photo geek and they can help you out uh, or could possibly help you out. So wrap up, um, you know, we know good photos are, are critical. Uh, I want to just encourage you, they're worth the time and expense to capture them. You, you, there's a lot of options on how to get good quality image, images there from uh, zero cost to a whole bunch of uh, thousands of dollars. But if you know some of these basics there, I can, uh, I'm hoping that I can save you some money there and it uh, and let you know it may be worth, worth it to hire a professional depending on the, the nature of the usage for that particular photograph. Uh, here's some contact, contact information for me. Now that I'm retired, I own a photography business. Uh, you're welcome to contact me uh, via email or social media. Um, and uh, so you can snap that or it'll be in the PDF. You can look at it later if you need. And, um, and if you need help, um, I also uh, can assist remotely. I do provide a, a service to uh, uh, photographers and um, other people having IT issues. I love solving problems. I love helping people do, uh, with their photo and technical issues. So we'd be glad to do that. So Q and A time, we have, uh, uh, about 10 minutes left. Um, so you've got a bunch of questions, Andy. I, I can read them out to you or you, okay. you can see them in the chat room. I've noticed that some of some of them came in when we paused earlier to take questions and they came a, a, a bunch rolled in immediately thereafter, but I think you have since answered some of them. Okay. But I'll, I'll just go straight down the list. So first from Sherry, uh, what is optical zoom and digital zoom? Sure, that's um, a good question. Um, there is um, almost, uh, if, if your camera has that, it's a, it's a feature that you can turn on and off. And optical zoom is, is creating the image in your camera with just with, an, with the optical lenses that are uh, um, installed or available on your, your, your camera. Let me use a cell phone, for example. The, uh, uh, if you have multiple lenses there, there, they are different, uh, focal lengths, different magnifications, and those are all optical. What, 
what um, uh, many phones and cameras today, point and shoots especially uh, offer, is in order to get closer to a subject, they allow you to uh, use your zoom button to zoom in closer to the subject, but it's not uh, because the lens is actually zooming, it's because they are processing the image in software inside the camera. And that's what we call a digital zoom. And that is that it's, uh, it's a software enhanced zoom. So it's, I um, uh, uh, hope that's clear, but it's, it's the difference between using real optics in the lens versus a, a software computer generated image uh, that's just magnified inside the camera. Thank you. And then from Neil Grant, um, he's asking, can you discuss what diffuse light is and how it can be directional? I think you did touch on this after his question came in, but. Yeah, and it, it, but that's it's still a good question because uh, the, the, the more diffuse it is, the less directional it is uh, in the extreme. Um, and so it is a balance there because if it's totally diffuse, uh, you lose some directionality, which is why um, I use uh, in the third case in the in the um, uh, in the high cost example, I use three lights there. They're all diffuse, but there's still some control over directionality, okay. and so it, it's a balancing act. Um, they are. Uh, uh, they are complementary, though. And then what lens do you recommend, focal length? Uh, excellent question. There's a lot of debates about that in, in the professional community. Uh, the, uh, uh, with the old 35 millimeter cameras, film cameras that many of us grew up with, uh, they came with a 50 millimeter lens. The 50 millimeter was, uh, was selected as a pretty much a standard for many, many years as uh, to closely reflect uh, human eye uh, field of view uh, for a 35 millimeter camera. Um, since then, we've got uh, a lot more variety and uh, most people uh, will recommend um, a little bit longer, uh, 85 to uh, 100 uh, millimeter uh, lens and so uh, that's that's again um, if you can even use a, uh, a longer lens I have a for example a 70 to 200 millimeter and if you can if you can get back and start using a, a 150 to 200 um, again the more distance you can have with a with high quality lens uh, again the less distortions you're going to have and more and a little bit better uh, perspective you're going to have. Okay. Um, again, a question came in asking which cell phone you used, and um, you answered that shortly thereafter in the PowerPoint. It was a Samsung Galaxy, I believe. Yes, that's an S10 Plus. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Um, then Doug White is saying he finds polarizing lenses to be helpful in photographing sculpture, especially outdoors. What are your thoughts about their use? Uh, it's an excellent, excellent recommendation. Um, I haven't, uh, I, I don't do a lot of uh, sculptures outdoors as I use my indoors my, with my studio lights. But if I were doing that um, on, a, uh, on a regular basis using outdoor light, a polarizer, uh, depending on the location of the sun and the, and the reflections in the in the, the ambient light, a polarizer is a way to cut out some uh, some unwanted reflections. It's very effective, and I think that's uh, uh, the uh, uh, in particular. There's one called a circular polarizer that works well with um, point and shoot and with uh, uh, digital cameras. And uh, each of those also comes with you know, the ability to rotate that filter to, uh, to find the right angle that will eliminate uh, some desired reflection. So that's a, that's a great suggestion. Good idea. 
And I think you partially answered the next question from Glenn Marlowe asking what kinds of lights are best. And again, you referenced several examples in the presentation after he asked the question. So okay. sort of prescient. All righty. Um, then uh, Glenn is also asking, which is a better lens, a point and shoot or a good iPhone? Um, the, um, good question. Um, the, the iPhones are the latest ones are, I uh, was just checking the ratings. Um, there's a, uh, a company that does nothing but uh, evaluate uh, lenses and cameras like that. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact um, website, but the company is DXO. And uh, if you look up DXO uh, 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 labs, you'll, you'll be able to see their test. They do independent testing of those. And for particular situations, uh, they will tell you uh, which one is uh, would be, you know, more accurate, more uh, more precise, uh, higher resolution. The reason I say that is because iPhones cover a large range. Uh, the earlier ones are not nearly as good as the latest ones. Uh, the latest iPhones are, are highly competitive to uh, some of the older point shoots. Okay. And do you have any? This is Lawrence Bechtel asking. Do you have any tips on taking? photographs of sculptures in clay versus bronze? Um, I, in particular, I don't have any in particular. Uh, I've done that uh, several times for Donella. And uh, I think the same principles uh, do apply. Uh, it is a little harder to, to um, because the clay is all that solid uh, one color. Um, which, uh, which means you really have to get that, uh, the, the light off to the side to, to be able to get that. And my only suggestion there is to try and take multiple photographs from different angles if you're trying to, to if that's allowable and, uh, and, and use that as a way to, uh, to get the different areas because that's, that is a, um, it is a problem, uh, you know, as far as a, a challenge to try and get all that uh, okay. in a clay. Okay. And then Troy is asking if you could please share the name of your preferred HDR processing software again. Sure. Uh, I'm going to pull that up here real quick on the, um, it's called uh, Photomatics Pro and it's uh, by a com company called HDR Soft and uh, runs about $99. And uh, just uh, quickly what happened is when I first, when I was getting started, I went to, uh, I was, went on a field trip with the camera club to Yellowstone uh, National Park in January, all snow everywhere. And they said, oh, you need to adjust for snow. And I was like, I don't know how to adjust for snow. At that point I did. And I said, so I'm just gonna bracket everything. Uh, our phone, my, my camera would automatically bracket take overexposed and underexposed pictures. And I found this software would go through my thousands of images and in a batch mode process them all. And then I could leave it overnight the next morning, look at them. I fell in love with HDR software. I mean, HDR pictures and I, anything that doesn't move, I do HDR just automatically. So hope that helps. Okay, and then from Suzanne Storer, what are some ways um, to use lighting to emphasize surface textures. Again, I think that the, um, um, I would, um, my, my couple things. One is you might zoom in to show, show those particular areas, uh, get close to them. Uh, two would be to uh, use a little less diffuse light as we kind of mentioned earlier question and make sure that uh, you, basically play with the, the position of that light relative to the sculpture to get it uh, uh, closer to 90, degree, 90 degrees off of, away from the, uh, the camera line of sight. And, um, 
and take a lot of pictures. I think uh, to get the pictures I showed y'all today, I took uh, approximately 120 pictures, 120 images. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of a little bit of experimentation there, but getting the, the uh, a little a little stronger, harsher light, and getting it off, mm -hmm. uh, off uh, away from the camera line of sight. Okay, and Neil Grant um, is asking, how do you know if a professional photographer is a good sculpture photographer? Um, I, I was thinking about that, and I was putting this together. Uh, you know, when it's um, a, uh, I, I'm a part of a professional organization called the Professional Photographers of America, and they actually have a, 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 a list of everybody who's in that organization and kind of what their specialty is. I don't remember seeing a lot of uh, uh, sculpture or artwork um, emphasis there. But uh, the bottom line is I would look for references and do it just like you were buying something from Amazon or eBay. Go find people who have used them and, uh, and ask the photographer for examples. Uh, if they don't have a good website and showing uh, their work, um, then uh, you know, I, would, I would keep looking. And so, uh, and shop around because it's, um, uh, you know, different photographers have different overhead and the overhead is what usually drives the price. Thank you. And Lance um, Glasser is asking why you didn't do the HDR processing in Lightroom. I actually use both. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the algorithm that um, uh, Adobe Photoshop Lightroom uses now is, is very competitive with uh, the third party software. Um, it was not for many years and, and to this, and, and still now I, I use it, I actually do both and compare them. The, the one uh, disadvantage for the one in Lightroom is that it doesn't give any options for uh, the, the type of processing that it does in order to compress the, the, the images. Um, the, in, the, in the case of, uh, there's a couple of different softwares, but the one I use, that Photomatic, for example, they have 30 or 40 different um, uh, templates or uh, uh, ways to combine that and different lighting techniques. And uh, so for different types of images, um, I might use a different um, uh, formula for combining those pictures. And Lightroom does not give give me any option. It has one option and one option only. So that's, that's the trade off there. It's a good starting place though. I mean, if you don't, if you don't want to buy more software and you already have Lightroom, it's definitely a good place to start. Thank you. And then Merrill is asking or stating that when photographing glazed clay or terracotta sculptures, I get a lot of point reflections that seem very hard to eliminate with relatively low cost lighting. Are there ways to utilize these reflections to enhance the image of the sculpture, i.e. rules for where the reflections look good versus bad? Um, general rule, I don't know of general rules to do that other than try and get them into areas that don't hide details. And that is um, uh, if you have smooth areas uh, with low level of detail, if you can position the light to where it uh, where that is, um, again, uh, the uh, sometimes you have some control that would, uh, as far as that where that light is, and uh, my only rule of thumb there is trying to, trying to get it into a position that would be um, that wouldn't detract from your subject. In other words, if you can get that if you can get that reflection off to the side, for example. Um, and uh, or in a smooth area. Um, but again, I think varying the amount of diffusion of that light, in other words, put some different, uh, different modifiers in front of it, uh, pieces of plastic, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, different color papers, different things like that. Uh, just, just enough to soften that little spotlight, that little, uh, we'll call a specular highlight is uh, sometimes just enough. 
So then a related question from Robert Rankin is that black finishes are difficult to photograph. Any suggestions? Uh, say that again. Um, uh, a black, that if the work has a black finish, a very dark finish, it's difficult yes. to photograph. Do you have any suggestions? Um, again, that was, uh, that is a tough one. Again, multiple lights is the, is, is the main thing that I can, that I would approach that problem with. Um, the, uh, uh, uh a grayer background is going to help if you have a you know a dark image on a real white background. Uh, your eye is going to automatically uh, shut down a little bit, and and your camera will as, as well. But metering off of that that dark um, is important uh, to get a a good exposure uh, to meter off of that uh, the dark finish. But mm -hmm. the um, uh, but having a couple of different lights and getting them pretty bright and getting in, uh, uh, say, with a, a, a dark gray background, uh, I think will make it easier to, to, to see uh, in, the, in those dark areas. Thank you. So there are a few more questions, but I know they're answered in your PDF. So I just wanted to share with everyone that Andy has generously put together a PDF of this presentation and we will send it to all of you tomorrow. Um, and uh, you can review it and um, I, I'm almost certain it's going to answer the, the couple of remaining questions that were addressed um, in the presentation. Um, Andy, I can't thank you enough you are the calmest person I've ever met. I have to tell the rest of, I have to tell everyone else that 20 minutes before this started, Andy came on and said that all of his power had just gone down and he, they'd just gotten it up again. And I nearly had a heart attack, but he's just completely calm and collected. So I thank you. <laughs> uh, my pleasure. And, and I, I, I do want to, again, emphasize how much help Donella has been. Um, I enjoy her work and her support of me. It's just, in, it's just incredible. So she really helped out on this too. I know. You're both great. Thank you so much. It's really been an honor having you share your expertise with us. And I'm sorry we couldn't have everyone on screen chatting away, but it would have been a cacophony of, with so many people. Um, yeah. And we look forward to seeing you at um, future events. Please uh, stay tuned and look for postings in our monthly Sculpture News e-bulletin. And um, Andy also generously offered to answer any follow-up questions and you've got his contact information in the PDF. So um, many thanks, Andy. Can't thank you enough. And thank thanks to all of you for um, being here and for sharing your, your questions and for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.